So hi, everybody. Welcome to NOAA Live. My name is Nicole Bartlett, and I'm going to be moderating today's webinar. This series is sponsored by NOAA's Regional Collaboration Network, where I work, which is spread across the country and helps connect people to all that NOAA does. Our amazing partner is Woods Hole Sea Grant, located at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution here on Cape Cod, Massachusetts. To find out about future webinars, you can look under the Woods Hole Sea Grant Education tab on their webpage or simply follow them on Facebook. This is the 28th webinar and the 10th week in a series designed to help you get to know NOAA and some of our incredible experts during these months of school closures. All of our speakers work for some part of NOAA, that's N-O-A-A, -A, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Today, we are so happy to introduce you to Nikki Fitzgerald with Texas Sea Grant in Anahuac, Texas. While we'll be talking about NOAA's role preserving and understanding coastal marshland, we want to recognize that we are all coming to you from the traditional lands of Native communities who have substantial traditional and local knowledge and much to share with us. We acknowledge that Nikki is coming to us from the land of the Karankawa. We're hosting this webinar from the ancestral lands of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe and the Wampanoag tribe of Gay Hedequina. A few guidelines before I hand you over to Nikki. You're all muted. We have a lot of people on the line and want to make sure everyone can hear her. However, there's a box where you can write questions. Some of you have already found that box to tell me where you're calling in from. So that's how you're gonna communicate with me during the webinar. I'm gonna keep track of those questions as you go and we'll stop every now and then and answer a few. We may not get to all of them, but we'll answer as many as we can. And you guys are definitely in for a treat today. Nikki has uh, shown a lot of, she even developed her own movies. So I want to warn you when we play those videos, we might have some, you know, audio issues because she was recording in the outdoors. And so just be patient if you can't hear. Um, we're going to go over all the content with you. All right, uh, Nikki, I'm going to turn myself off here, put your slides up and uh, you can take it away. All right. Thank you. So thank you all for joining us today. Um, in Texas, we've got some beautiful weather. So hopefully where you're at right now, it's beautiful also. But let me tell you a little bit about myself because um, I know I've got some Dayton people actually watching. I actually grew up in Dayton, Texas, the home of the Fighting Broncos. Um, and when I graduated from Dayton, I went off to Texas A&M University and I got a degree in animal science and a master's degree in education administration. Now I went to A&M to actually become a veterinarian or a doctor or some amazing thing like that. But I found out when I got to A&M that I passed out at the sight of blood. Did not turn that back on. Hey, that's us. Computer audio, okay. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Hang on, we're getting some interference here, Nikki. Hold on one yeah, second. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know why I'm hearing people. Hello. So, I just want to make sure all my attendees are muted. I don't know why. I don't know either. It's okay. Hey, it won't let me exit. Okay, hang on. We've got one person. Oh, you know what? It might have been someone that was logging in. I had two logins for you, so it might have been someone a family member perhaps that was logging in using yours? Probably. I think we okay. got it figured out. <laughs> okay, got it, got it. Okay, please continue. Sorry about that. It's okay. Um, so we have, you know, I got my degree in animal science and I found out that I don't like blood. And so, you know, I didn't quite become the veterinarian and I went into teaching and I've been, I taught for the, like the last 12 years at two different high schools, Anahuac High School and East Chambers High School. And I found out that I'm actually an amazing teacher and kind of what led me to this job, which I'll talk about in a second. And I still live in Anahuac, Texas with my two daughters and my husband. And I have been there ever since. And those are pictures of my daughters there in our rice fields and looking at our cattle because we are uh, farmers and ranchers where we live. So. We'll move to the next slide. Um, so, all right. So 
I do work for Texas Sea Grant, which is part of NOAA. Um, and I work also as an AgriLife Extension agent for Texas A&M University. So I have a very, very long title, like that long. It's really hard to tell people all the time, but my basic title is Texas Sea Grant, Texas A&M AgriLife, Coastal Marine Extension Resources Agent. <laughs> That's my title. But basically my main role is an educator. So I went from becoming a teacher in a classroom to now I'm an educator, basically outdoors, everywhere. I wear many, many different hats for the job that I do now. And if you look at the pictures, you can see at the top left corner that I'm actually an educator for, like I was educating on the beach there and I had students and I was teaching them about stuff. And then the bottom right hand corner, I have a plate of shrimp and I basically got to teach people where their food comes from and how it's caught. And in the middle there, I'm working on a shrimp boat and I'm with the NOAA team there and we're actually helping the shrimpers get ready for shrimping season by checking their nets and their TEDs. And a TED basically is a device that they put inside those nets to help turtles escape in case they accidentally get caught. So we're there to help the shrimpers make sure all of that is intact and ready to go before they start their season. And on the bottom right hand corner, that's a picture of me in a life jacket on a boat. And that's a bunch of first graders on the boat. And I'm actually going down the river and teaching them about the Natchez River and how their watershed and everything, kind of what I'm going to do with you today. And the top right hand corner is actually my daughter that's in a boat there. And in that, we built those boats for camps and so I help run camps during the summer and then you're probably wondering why there's a picture of a helicopter in the middle well as a Texas A&M AgriLife Extension agent when there's an emergency or a problem like a hurricane or something like that we go into emergency management mode so I get to help with that when there's a hurricane and so that helicopter I actually got to ride on and deliver hay all around our county for animals that were stranded during Tropical Storm Imelda. And so, yeah, I have many, many, many different hats that I work with here uh, as a Sea Grant and AgriLife agent. So it's, it's a neat job. I, I love this job, it's amazing. <laughs> so, all right, so we're gonna move on to what is the purpose of a marsh? Because this whole thing that I'm gonna talk about today with you is about marsh in my backyard and so you have a few choices here and i'm not going to tell you the answer until a little bit later but what do you think the purpose of the marsh is is it a to filter our drinking water b flood control c erosion control or d all the above and you can put your answer in the chat box there so. Okay, so we're starting to get some answers coming in, Nikki. Um, uh, we have, Ellie thinks it's B. Um, uh, we have a, a lot of Ds, um, but uh, Christopher wants to know, what do you mean when you say, what does a lot of hats mean? What does that mean? You have different jobs? Well, I have many different roles in my job. Basically, you know, one minute I'm on a boat teaching kids and the next minute I'm on a boat with shrimpers or I'm in a helicopter helping people feed their animals during a hurricane. So yes, many, many different roles. <laughs> Got it, perfect. Um, that makes sense. I'm glad that uh, Christopher, he said thank you for that. Yeah, um, for that so question. let's see, <laughs> Michelle thinks it's B. Uh, we've got a couple of Bs, a lot of Ds, and even a C. So um, I think we should probably take them into your backyard now, huh? Should yeah, I so I'm currently in Beaumont, Texas, in my office in the middle of a city. So we're going to have to get to the marsh, right? So I made a video to help us get there. So y'all ready? Okay, so let's get this video started. All right, <laughs> let's see. Hopefully this works. Okay, here we go. Howdy, welcome to my backyard marsh. Well, 
I think it's my backyard marsh. I don't think we're in the right spot. Let's go to the right spot. Well, hello there. Did we make it to the marsh yet? I don't think so. Wow, what a rush. Well, I made it to my backyard. Y'all ready to go explore more of it? ecosystem you ask. So it makes up all of our living, biotic, and our non-living, abiotic, they make up this given area. And if you look around us, there is so much biodiversity around here. There's so much food and habitat and animals that live here that make up this wonderful ecosystem that we live in. So what makes a wetland a wetland? Well, there are three things that make a wetland a wetland. Number one, hydrology. There's water everywhere, as far as the eye can see. Lots of water. Next is the hydrophytic soil. The soil that's beneath me loves to absorb water. And third, the hydrophilic plants. Hydro means water, philic means loves, and these plants love water. How is this a marsh and not a swamp? Well, if you look around as far as the eye can see, all we have here is herbaceous plants. Basically, these plant stems are green. Versus a swamp, if you was to see a swamp, all it would have is trees. And when you look around, I don't really see any trees, do you? It's all grass as far as I can see. So, both are wetlands and they both serve amazing purposes. So we need to go explore what those purposes are. Are y'all ready? Let's go. So one of the first purposes I'm gonna talk about, about the marsh, is how it filters pollution. We have so much pollution coming from like pet waste and sewer systems and highways and things like that. Well, it all has to go somewhere and it goes into our watershed and it eventually will end up into our marshes and they work like the kidneys of mother earth and they filter it. So the water basically flows down through the vegetation and it filters it through the vegetation, the soil, will also filter the water to make it cleaner for us to drink. And the bacteria in the soil will also do something called nitrogen fixation, where it takes all the extra nitrogen and makes it something usable that the plants can use. Which leads us to our next purpose. Since the marsh is really good at filtering our water, it's also really good at replenishing our water. The water absorbs down into the ground and is stored inside of these reservoirs underground. And that's where your drinking water comes from. There's only a certain amount of drinking water on earth, so it is up to you to take care of our water and not pollute it. So another purpose of the marsh is flood control. We average like 50 inches of rain here a year. And if you look around the bottom of these plants, there's actually standing water and it's like this all year long. And this hydrophytic soil is what absorbs this water like a sponge. And so when we have huge tropical storms, like we had Harvey and Imelda, this soil acts really good at absorbing it. With Hurricane Harvey, 
and Tropical Storm Imelda, both storms brought so much water that the water rose so fast, all the roads were impassable. We were getting around in airboats. In fact, I had to use an airboat just to get to my house. But if you think about it, all of this water has to go somewhere. So usually it drains through our wetlands and our marshes. Thank goodness they are there. I bet you're wondering why I'm sitting on top of a barge in the middle of the field with no water. Well, that leads me to my next purpose. A marsh is a great buffer zone for storm surges. So during Hurricane Ike, it brought a 22 foot storm surge through here. And that storm surge is what brought this barge here and actually left it sitting in my backyard. So one purpose of the marsh is erosion control. As you can see, this bank is starting to erode away, but all of these grasses and things like this have deep roots and these deep roots will crisscross and hopefully help prevent the erosion from going any further. So another purpose of the marsh is that plants in the marsh take in a lot of carbon. If you think about it, a plant does photosynthesis. And for photosynthesis, it needs water and it takes in carbon dioxide and then it also releases oxygen. So take a deep breath and breathe in that oxygen and enjoy the fact that the marsh can store a lot of carbon. And one of my favorite parts of the marsh is recreation, of course. Like going fishing or taking a kayak trip. So one of the great purposes of marshes is it provides a habitat or a home to many animals. And we have many animals out here and you probably can hear some of the birds chirping behind me, but we have a lot of alligators and crabs and shrimps and of course humans that call this place home. So you can see that our marsh is a very valuable ecosystem and serves many, many purposes. So let's review some of those purposes we've learned today. It filters out our pollution, it absorbs a lot, a lot of water. It stores carbon. It replenishes our drinking water, helps with the erosion control, and provides an amazing habitat to many animals, and of course provides recreation purposes. So I hope you enjoyed what we've learned today and enjoyed exploring the marsh with us today. Hopefully you'll stay curious and come explore some more. All right, Nikki, are you, uh, you got your, your audio on? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Right. Yes, I can hear you. Perfect. Okay. So that question, what is the purpose of a marsh? If you answer D, all of the above, then you are correct. Actually, if you answered all of those, you were correct because they're all right. Correct. So, all right. So what I have here and what we're going to do next is an activity. This is a stream table. I'm gonna get my person to help me here. Can y'all see my little stream table here? And I might have to just kind of sit down so you can kind of see me with it. Um, and this is going to represent our marsh in what we call a watershed and an estuary. So do we, I hope, do y'all know what an estuary is? Yes or no? Um, let's see, you guys know, no, we, we, at least a handful of folks are saying no, but they need a little explanation. Okay. So an estuary is basically where a river, and this is going to be our river meets the ocean. And so it's basically where our salt water and fresh water meet. Okay. So this will be our estuary area. And this is kind of your marsh area. And then up here is like our towns and our cities and stuff like that. And so if you live in a town or a city near a river or whatever, that's a watershed. So you live in that given watershed. So 
that's kind of how this is going to work. So what I'm going to show you is basically how a watershed works. And you saw, you know, the video how it filter, filters and things. So one thing with a river, we need water, right? So I guess we need to make it rain. Let's see here. I'm gonna get. All right, so I'm going to make it rain. And up here is our lake near a little city. And as you can see, the water is starting to meander down. And it actually is making another little area here. It's got two areas it's coming down. And what you're going to notice as the water is pushing, you know, get a little closer there, it's actually moving or eroding away the soil. Y'all see that? Y'all see it? Okay. Okay. So the plants here have roots, and these roots are what's actually helping with that erosion control. So marshes are really good with erosion control. As you can see on this side of the river, there's not a much not much erosion control. And all of the sand and dirt is deposited or depositioned out into the estuary. And that's what's creating like a delta area. So at the end of like our area, it's called delta. And where your salt water and your fresh water meet, we also call that brackish water. And we're going to go into that more a little bit later. Now, in our marshes, it also creates a habitat. So we got our little alligator there. So there's our habitat. Um, we also have oysters living in here. Um, anybody know what a good thing an oyster does? Okay, let me ask. Anyone, anyone want to share what they know about oysters? Randy says they filter. Perfect. And, uh, Randy is correct. Yeah. They do filter, as does the marsh. We ran out of water in here a little bit. So turn that a on. lot of people also want to make sure you know that they think oysters are good to eat as well. They are good to eat. <laughs> yes, they are good to eat. And so another thing about a marshland, it creates what's called a living shore or a living coastline. So this living coastline, again, is like a habitat control, erosion control, and it's also pollution control. And so these grasses will actually, if you were to like throw some trash down or something like that, it would actually catch the trash and things in our grasses. So it's kind of like a little net that catches trash. Not that you're supposed to throw your trash on the ground. You need to recycle your trash, okay? Um, one thing we do find a lot in our marshes is balloons. Um, if one thing I can emphasize my pet pee is if you have a party and you have a bunch of balloons, don't release your balloons. Cause if your balloons go up, they must come down and they go down somewhere and it causes a big issue and the animals will actually eat the balloons and choke and some could actually die on them. So you know, I always try to tell people, don't release your balloons. So, um, all right. So I think I got a couple of questions to see if y'all were paying attention. So let's see here. Okay. Do you want me to put the, um, the, uh, the, the next question up? Is that yes, what you're asking? Okay. All right. Let me take care of that. We'll fix it too. I ran out of water. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Let's see. Um, so we did this one. Um, let's see. Can everyone see my slide? What helps with erosion control? Okay. So um, let's see. So what helps with erosion control? A, the soil or dirt. B, building dams or barriers. C, plant roots or vegetation. Or D, building a fence. Okay, let's see. So we've got, um, see, Randy thinks it's C. Okay. I'm getting a lot of C's about vegetation. Sophia says A. Um, uh, and Christopher also guesses A, and so does Elizabeth. Um, Liam says it's A and C. Um, and we're getting a lot of C's. Okay, so the answer is C. 
Uh, so it is C. Now erosion is moving the soil and dirt, but the plants and roots and vegetation is what controls it. Now building dams and barriers could actually help, but one of my things is, is if I put a barrier there, will this wood be here forever? Yes or no? All right, what do you think kids? If she puts that barrier up there, is it gonna stay? Um, we're getting a lot of no's. Connor and Ellie and Nolan and Sophia, they all agree that it's no. Yeah, no, correct. So if that, if you have a barrier there, over time it will break down or a storm will move it and it gets very costly having to replace it. So with vegetation, you know, you plant it, it'll keep growing more and more and more and hopefully that's the key that that living shoreline will help protect. Um, our estuaries and erosion control and pollution and all the things that we learn. All right, so what's our next question that we have? Okay, let me see here. Got true or false? Pollution is filtered through our soil and the plants to make the water cleaner for us to drink. All right, guys, what, true what do you think? Guys. True or false? Let's see, Ellie, Randy, Philip, Duncan, Hudson, William, Sloan, all think it's true. Um, Sophia's the lone wolf right now. Let's see, everyone else seems to think, oh, she changed back to true. So I, we're getting a large consensus that it's true. Yes, so our plants and our soil and all of that will filter our water and our pollution and stuff. One thing you need to understand as a citizen is if you get too much pollution, our land and our plants may not be able to keep up. So it's up to you guys to make sure we don't pollute as much. So that way we have clean drinking water forever and ever, because we only have a certain amount of water on this earth and we're not getting any more. So we got to keep it clean. We need it. Do y'all have any questions? Yeah, we do have um, questions right now. So I'm gonna turn off my um, slides just so folks can just see you. Um, okay, I'm gonna move back towards my desk here. Okay. And, um, oh, perfect. Okay, so a few of the questions that we've gotten so far. Um, uh, Mercy says to remind everyone that you also work in ports and with seafarers across the world. So that's another one of your hats that you wear um, <laughs> that we wanted to make sure got mentioned. Um, Thank you, Ms. Mercy. <laughs> so Sam wants to know, how long have you lived in the alligator capital of Texas? Uh, let's see here, 13 years. <laughs> I've been there for 13 years. I lived wow. in this area my whole life and I'm 35 years old, so. Wow. Um, and uh, Liam wanted to ask, as you were going through the habitat, are there, uh, do, the cro do the crocodiles help? Do the crocodiles help or? Yeah, with any of the aspects of the coastal marshland, like what role do they play in the ecosystem? Okay, so we don't have crocodiles where we live. We have oh. alligators. Alligator. Um, there's, there are two different things there and the alligators do help they are predators and they keep our prey in check. You know what a predator prey is? So basically they keep our population level. If we didn't have alligators, then we might be overran by uh, certain turtles or fish or frogs because they eat those things. So they it's kind of a check and balance thing with our animals. They, they all eat each other. <laughs> <laughs> That makes sense. Um, okay, Duncan wants to know what types of grasses are in the marsh? Well, we have, uh, this is mo like a smooth cord grass. We have types of salt grass and sea grass. Um, then we have some invasive grass. Invasive means that it's grass that was probably brought there that wasn't supposed to be there. We have sedges and different rushes and things like that, so. We have many, many different kinds of grasses. Um, and of course, we get this question every time. Um, Jennifer's asking, what is the, your favorite part of your job? Um, I have many, many, many favorite parts. 
I think my favorite part about the job is that every single day is different. Like there is not one day that I do the same thing. Like obviously I'm on a NOAA webinar today and then tomorrow I might be out in the marsh planting grass or something. So it's different every single day. <laughs> Great. Um, Lindy wants to know, are there any cetaceans in the marsh? Are there any what? Cetaceans. So any um, marine mammals or anyone, anything that comes into the marsh? Uh, we've got many different animals that live in the marsh. <laughs> We're actually fixing to go over that. That's our next thing we're fixed to talk about. Um, so what kind of animals do y'all think live in the marsh? Oh, that's that's a good question, because um, we are getting questions from folks about the animals, and I know that's coming up next. That so we're gonna is finish. coming up soon. We'll take a couple more questions, and we'll have to get back there. What do you yeah, think? So, so James <laughs> thinks there's birds. Sloan thinks there's ducks. Yeah. Isabella says crocodiles, but we've already <laughs> talked about that. It's alligators, it's right? Alligators. <laughs> Got to make sure we learn uh, that it's alligators in the coastal marsh. Um, hermit crabs. Other people say turtles. So, but to the question of whether there are whales or dolphins in the marsh. Okay, so not exactly in the marsh. Our S, you know, where our marsh leads is to that estuary I was showing you. And that estuary will eventually lead out to an ocean. And when it gets to the ocean, that's where you're going to actually find your dolphins and whales and those kind of things. So, gotcha. Um, in your marsh, you kind of find your smaller fish now you'll get some rare things come up in the marsh every once in a while but there's always exceptions to everything <laughs> what about manatees do you ever see a manatee yeah actually there has been manatee sightings where we live so all right um, well and then we've also got fish uh and wild we have otters too <laughs> otters cool. yeah all right um let's see uh we're people want to know how close you've been to a alligator uh, to a um, alligator so i think we're going to show them that in a second you know, yeah i think we need to get ready so why don't yeah. i get my gear don't yeah i think you get your gear on if we're going to be going into the marsh yeah we're going to get ready let me put my hat on so in my marsh kind of need a net and a fishing pole so are we ready I think we're ready. I'm gonna get you. I'm gonna get you going. Okay, let's get going back to that marsh. Shh. I think I see an alligator over there. So go see if we can find it. Wait, I'm not in the marsh. I bet you're ready to go see some animals in the marsh. I know I am. Well, I guess we better get there. Well, we made it to my backyard. Are y'all ready to go see some more? I am. Let's go explore some more of it. Come on, let's go. buggy you can't get around the marsh that easily you have to have something like a marsh buggy or an airboat to actually navigate through there you can't just walk because you'll sink so today we're gonna hike on one of these to begin with and let's begin our adventure well we're out here where it is wet and we need this marsh buggy to get around and check on our backyard or do what we call a prescribed or controlled burn. 
which is a management practice to replenish the marsh nutrients and get rid of dry and unwanted grasses. Along the way, we will see lots of wildlife, including wild feral hogs and muskrat nests. first adventures we're going to have is here at the saltwater barrier gates and it is what it sounds like a gate that basically regulates the amount of salt water and fresh water enter and leave the marsh as you can see it's high tide and the water is rushing in through the gate right now it will probably eventually cover some of the plants in the marsh but one amazing thing about this place since you have fresh water and you have salt water, which is brackish water, well, you have fresh water and salt water organisms around here, or animals. So we're gonna be able to find a lot of biodiversity here with this salt water and fresh water area. And let's see what we can find. Let's grab some nets and see what we can find. So one of our first activities we're gonna do is I'm gonna show you how to catch a blue crab. And it's like fishing except for you're tying a piece of meat onto a rope and you have a net to scoop it up. So here's some leftover roast I had in the kitchen. And you could use a chicken leg or a piece of sausage. We have some sausage too with us. And you just tie it onto the rope. And then you basically put it down here in the water and let's see what we can catch. Sometimes it could be a little tricky to catch these tasty blue crabs. Some people like to use crab traps, but I like to use the old fashioned net, rope with the bait, because it's just so much fun. And because we have such mild winters, you can find a bunch of these blue crabs during the summer. Look at there, we caught one. Ain't she a beauty? Let's look at her up close. Crabs are crustaceans and they have compound eyes. They can see all the way around them. And they have five pairs of legs, including the pinchers. And the last pair are paddles, so they can swim or dig in the mud. This is a female crab. As you can see right here, it is very wide across. If it's narrow, then it's a male crab. This is a female crab. We also have fiddler crabs. They move sideways, have one little pincher, one big pincher, and they live in the holes in the mud. And they get their name from the way they move their pincher, like a fiddle. So let's get our gear on and get ready to get into the water. shrimp. Shrimp love to live in marsh estuaries to have their babies. They'll lay up to 100,000 to a million eggs and 24 hours later they'll hatch and they'll live there a while until it's time to swim out to the ocean and they swim using their little legs called the swimmerettes. Caught many fish too and all fish are shaped a little different. You can look at their shapes and fins to identify what kind of fish they are. This is a Texas croaker. It's part of the drum family. 
but it gets its name for the sound it makes. Let's listen. The best way to get in the middle of a marsh, well, maybe not the best way, but a fun way to get in the middle of the marsh is to take a kayak from a bayou through a slough. And a slough is basically a natural ditch that runs through the marsh. So I'm about to jump on and see what we can find out in the middle of the marsh. kayaking, there were a gar coming right up to the kayak and actually hitting the kayak. There was alligator gar and needle nose gar. There's actually four species of gar in Texas, but the alligator gar is unique. It is the largest of the gar species. It can actually get up to eight foot and weigh up to 300 pounds. That kayaking trip was so much fun. We've seen so many things so far. We've seen some alligator gar, some crab, and shrimp. I'm really ready to go actually see the alligators. And I know the perfect spot to go find that mama alligator and her babies. I'm ready to go. How about you? Here we got the American alligator. It's a lot different from a crocodile. It's got a wider snout. She's not as big as a crocodile would be. She is a little aggressive right now because she's protecting her babies. I'm trying to be really careful because I might have to run here in a second. She could come out on bank and they're kind of fast when they come out. But we are in Anahuac, Texas. This is the alligator capital of Texas. So we have lots of these around here. I'm gonna get out of her way. How exciting. I've got a baby alligator here. It's probably about two years old. You can hear it's making a noise. It's calling for its mama. I hope the mama doesn't come. But alligators are reptiles. They are cold-blooded. Sometimes you'll see them sit up on the uh, side of the bank because they're sunning and they're trying to regulate the temperature. But when it gets too warm, they'll go under the water and be under there for a little while. And a neat thing about alligators is they lay eggs in a big old nest. So a mama alligator might make 60 to 70 eggs in a big old nest and it looks like a hay pile. So the temperature of the eggs, you know, if it gets hotter or colder, will determine whether it becomes a boy or a girl. But as you can see, it's ready to go back to its mama. So we're gonna release it back into the wild. Say hey girls. we leave out here, let's see if we can find a few birds on the way home. Southeast Texas is one of the best birding places in the whole wide world. There are thousands of species of birds that come here and all are adapted in many different ways. Some have long beaks, some have short beaks, some have long legs, some have short legs. But this is one of the best places in the world and a birder's dream right here. hope that you enjoyed your journey through the marsh and getting to see all the animals today. I know I did. I love having all this in my backyard and I hope that someday that maybe you could come visit Anahuac and see all this too. So anyways, I gotta get back to Beaumont. I guess I better get back over there. Y'all ready? I hope you enjoyed the marsh today. I hope you learned a lot about animals and everything that the marsh contains. Uh, thank you for coming. And this video is brought to you by Texas A&M AgriLife Extension and Texas Sea Grant. Thank you and goodbye. Wow, Nikki, that was so cool. Thanks. <laughs> I hope y'all enjoyed that. That took a lot of work. <laughs>
Yeah, I think we, I mean, I enjoyed it. And I've been seeing a lot of messages from um, the audience saying how much they enjoyed it too. So uh, I'm getting amazing and cool and um, and also a few additional questions. I know you wanted to, um, to ask kids this last question. Let me just right. show my screen here. So, um, so Nikki wanted to know what was your favorite animal on the video? So we saw um, muskrat and hog, we saw crab and fish, we saw shrimp, we saw alligators, we saw birds, or you can say H, all of them. So let's see. And then Nikki, if you don't mind turning on your camera um, so we can see your face again. Is it not on? Or not, uh, not at the moment. Oh, never mind. I'm sorry. It's just because I have my slides. Up. Sorry, I just turned it off. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Grace says you're visible, so you're good. Okay. <laughs> I'm All good. Right. Okay, good. Um, so let's see. So Philip says C. He really liked the crab. Um, Morgan says all of them. Uh, we're getting emphatic H's for all of them. Oh, okay. um, let's see. And yeah, but I think we don't have any clear favorite, although, oh, we're getting a lot of Fs here, a lot of alligators. Um, in fact, I'm going to stop um, showing my screen for a second so we can just uh, be on camera and maybe take some questions. Does that sound good? I don't know if I realize I actually have an alligator in my office. <laughs> I gotta, I gotta figure out why I can't see you. Let me find. Um, let's see, let me just try to get back up here. Hmm. Okay, well, apparently I'm visible, but I'm, I'm unable to see you right now. So, um, so let's see. One of the questions that we uh, got asked was whether there are ever beavers in the rivers that you described in Texas. Yes, there are beavers. <laughs> they do right. make the little beaver dams and everything that you see about. <laughs> oh, good. Um, let's see. And then someone asked in one of the videos you showed that there were two crabs stuck together, the blue mm -hmm. crab, and um, and Christopher wanted to know why that was. I. They were probably just fighting each other. Sometimes when you put them head to head like that, they'll grab onto whatever they can catch onto, and that's what they do. It's kind of their nature. So whatever cool. they can pinch onto, they'll pinch, they'll pinch onto each other sometimes. Um, let's see. So Jackson says hi, and he wants to know if you've ever caught an alligator. Yeah, I just caught one in the video. Do you see it? <laughs> and if you look here, this is actually one we caught behind our house. This was an 11 foot alligator. So we have an alligator hunting season, just like you have a season for other animals. And sometimes people do come hunt the alligators. And this one was one that was actually hunted. So it, it actually swam right between my legs before it got hunted. So it was very scary. <laughs> <laughs> that does sound scary. Um, Lindy was asking yeah, about how many alligators are in the marsh. Is, is, are there... uh, probably thousands um, where we live. There's probably thousands of alligators because um, that nest that you saw in the video will hold 60 to 70 eggs at a time. And so if all the mama alligators have 60 to 70 babies, not all of those eggs will hatch, but a lot of them will so you'll get a bunch of alligators born all at once so it's quite a few yeah. um let's see um philip asks you said that temperature determined if alligators become boys or girls what temperature causes which gender oh uh, that's a good question um i think it's like a one degree difference that actually causes the temperature between the boy and the girl is is it hotter I have my co-partner over here. He's actually looking it up. I think the hotter it is, is the males and the colder is females, but I could be wrong on that. <laughs> All right, we'll get we'll get some clarification. We'll wait for yeah, we'll have to clarify that one later. But it is only a one degree difference that actually makes the boys and the or the males and the females in the nest. So 
So we're going to circle back to James's question. James here in Mashpee asked, what's your favorite animal in the marsh? Um, I, I guess the alligator. I really do like the alligator. Those alligator gars, they're pretty fun to see too. Those are some pretty big fish out there. Um, I think the neat thing about living in the marsh is every day I see a new animal that may not have been there before. Um, so it, it's, it's really neat. So. <laughs> Are there any um, endangered species in your marsh? Yes, there are endangered species. Um, we actually have eagles that have been flying around our marsh lately and those are endangered. Um, and they've actually been quite showing up here more frequently. So we do have some eagles there. No, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, actually, we, we usually get this question a lot too. Um, um, uh, your friend Mercy wants to know what's the weirdest thing you've ever seen in the marsh. Um, that's a good question. The weirdest thing I've ever seen in the marsh: a toilet. <laughs> <laughs> so with the hurricanes and stuff that we have, uh, those surges actually bring a lot of debris over. And so sometimes randomly, I'll be walking through the grasses and find things like a toilet or a sink. <laughs> So, but as far as like the animals, like we have eels, those are really weird. Um, they look like snakes, but they're really slippery. So every once in a while you'll come across those. So we did have somebody look it up uh, and get back to us that the warmer temperature leads to a, a boy, a male. Yes, it is. It's 93 degrees. He actually looked it up for me. 93 oh. degrees would be mostly males and 86 degrees would be mostly females. So yeah. I was... I was good. Warmer males, colder females. <laughs> so you had mentioned when you were um, in the in the marsh with the alligators that you didn't want the mom to come when you were holding the baby alligator. Um, do they stay with their mothers after they're hatched for a while, or they, when, do, when do they branch out? A year to two years, they'll actually stay with their mother. So that that was probably about a year and a half to two year old alligator that I was holding. Um, so the mother probably was nearby somewhere. I did not see her, but that's the, even though you don't see them, they're probably still there. They hide under the water or in the grasses very well. Um, you have to be very careful because you might actually step on one. Yeah. yeah. And one thing I do want to reiterate after doing this video guys is please don't feed the alligators and please don't try to catch one yourself. Okay. Um, we, you know, we've been around these enough that we know how to handle these alligators and things. So don't do what I just did. <laughs> so um, do you are, when your land borders a marshland like that, do you have to worry about uh, gators coming and threatening your livestock? Do they become predators for anything on your farm? They do. Um, this, alligator that I showed here, the reason why we were hunting him was because he was actually eating the baby calves that would come up and drink in the water where he was living. Um, and the male alligators are the ones that actually get really, really huge. Female alligators don't get as big. So uh, normally it's the males that are hunted. So. Hmm. But yeah, and they actually, I've actually had one on my front porch before. <laughs> so. Oh my God. <laughs> well, I knew I knew I was in Anahuac with my first year teaching when I had a student, one of my students when I was in class, called into school because they could not get to the school bus because there was an alligator on their front porch. And our principal had to actually go and pick them up, like they had to crawl out the side window to get into a truck to go to school. <laughs> so I knew I was in the alligator capital then. <laughs> wow. That would be like, welcome to Anahuac, right? Yeah, uh, but yes. <laughs> okay, so somebody wants to know, and I think this is a pretty good question. Um, this is my friend Kim's daughter in Rhode Island. She wants to know, how did you get the marsh? Say that again. How did you get the marsh? So how, did, how, do, you, how do you buy a yard with a marsh in it? <laughs> well, I didn't necessarily, I'm married into this. Um, my, <laughs> hus <laughs> my husband's family, um, they kind of migrated over there a long, long, long time ago and they started a ranch and the ranch is a little further up from the marsh, but it all kind of connects into the back. So 
yeah, that's how I got into it. I married into it. <laughs> wow, that is a cool story. Um, so you had mentioned the alligator gars, and I wanted you to, could you just explain the difference between the gars and actual alligators? Because we saw them on the video, but um, people who aren't familiar with gars may not be, may not be, uh, understand what kind of fish those are. Okay, so they are a, a bony type of fish, like they actually have a skeletal system inside of them. And the alligator gar is very unique to our area because they're not really found in many other areas. Now there are four species of gars and there are smaller gars in different parts of the Texas, but in our areas where you find the alligator gar. And the reason why they call them the alligator gar is because they're, the front of the fish is stout literally looks kind of it's wider and it looks like an alligator and it actually has teeth and so those fish have teeth they can bite you um, and they can get up to eight foot long and i've actually seen one eight foot long which is taller than me i'm five foot eight um and yeah they're huge <laughs> they can they are predators and they do eat other animals so. wow um, we had just got a really good question from um, Sophia, who wants to know, and I, I thought you might have touched on this early on, but I can't remember, about the difference between a swamp and a marsh. Okay, so the marsh where I live is basically just all grass, and a swamp, you're going to see trees, and you're going to see those trees that are adapted for water, where they have the big wide bottoms of them um, and they are both considered wetlands so they are both wetlands but that's the biggest difference is a swamp has trees and a marsh is just like a wet grassy area is where, what I would call it so Great. we don't have many trees where I live my kids are kind of sad about that because we can't have a tree house <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's a, that is interesting. As I look around my yard, I have lots of trees, but no um, no grasses like you have. They're very yeah, beautiful. It, it is really windy where I live because we really don't have a lot of trees to break the wind. So it is we got a constant breeze year round where I live. So <laughs> wow, that's really cool. Well, um, uh, we are so happy that you joined us today, Nikki. We there's a few questions that folks uh, that we didn't get to, so I hope. You guys can uh, look up if you want to learn what alligators eat in the marsh and um, what alligator gars look like and how big they are. You can um, go look those up and, and let us know. I want to remind folks that we are currently voting for your favorite presenters to bring back for our all-star webinar on June 12th. So you can go on uh, the website and cast your vote. One vote per person, please. And um, we're also still taking our petroglyphs from Malia Evans' talk last week uh, in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. So I hope that you guys will remember those two things. And then um, Nikki and your friends down there, you might like to tune in on Friday when we have Chris talking with us about horseshoe crabs. So um, we're very excited for that one. Um, but thank you for the videos you made. Thank you for uh, your family helping you with those and um, all the folks at Sea Grant. Um, I know that those videos were spliced together from a couple of different times, but um, you definitely made it look like we were in that marsh. So thank you so much. You're welcome. And thank you for having me today. And I enjoyed getting to answer all these wonderful questions and always stay curious and try to learn more, so. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much, Nikki. Have a great day. Bye, everybody. We'll see you Friday. Bye.